All right. Then welcome everybody to this guest lecture, the last lecture of deep learning for NLP. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ivan, for the nice introduction. So as he already mentioned, I'm also part of some lectures from the UKP lab. One of them is the ethics. Oh, sorry, it's no. Nope. I cannot do anything on this laptop anymore, Ivan. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no? Yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> User error. Okay. Yeah, I'm part of the, the ethics and NLP lecture. So who of you have already heard this year's iteration of ethics and NLP, in particular the ethics in generative AI? One, two, three, maybe. Okay. So sorry for you guys. Um, most of the stuff that I will present today will be stuff that you already saw. Not all of it, maybe, I don't know, 60% or so. I skipped all the introductory part because you already are aware of what a large language model is, so I don't have to retell it. But I will uh, nevertheless give you an introduction of NLP models. So I will also, no, we have um, like a video here. I don't want to play it now because we don't have the sound of it. But um, I mean, you already have heard and seen many of these deep fake videos. This one would be a video of uh, Barack Obama talking something that he usually doesn't talk about. So words were put in his mouth by um, Mr. Peel, uh, a comedian and other, he does other things. And this is one of the topics we will discuss today. But yeah, let's start with the introduction. Oh yeah, let's start with the introduction of what we will also see today. So as you've already known, as you already know that generative AI, generative AI models, large language models are really a big topic nowadays. They're extremely popular right now, not only, but in particular when JetGPT was announced and made public in November 2022, so last year. And of course, last month it was uh, in the media all over the place. And then we had other tools that I also want to do briefly introduce, you probably know most of them, but I will at least tell you what are the differences and what you can do with them and what you cannot. So I will give you a brief overview of especially these textual tools, also some other generative tools that can generate video, audio, or other stuff. And then the most of the lecture will be about this part. So users, yes, positive use cases for these generative AI models and tools, but also misuses. So of course, when people can do stuff, then there are always people that try to do bad stuff. All right. So first of all, introduction, at least for the most uh, important, most um, public tools that you already know. And this is maybe the most popular of them by far. So the ChatGPT, the prototype of OpenAI based on a large language model, GPT-3 or GPT-3.5. So bit of an advanced version of uh, GPT that was trained on web data until 2021, which is one important limitation. And it has a context size of 4,096 tokens. What does context size mean in this case? Well, it is the part of the AI, the, the input size of the AI model. So it can incorporate the stuff that you point in and uh, you type in and also the uh, conversation that you already had with this model. So you can say, okay, it's part of the memory. And yeah, it has these often stated 175 billion parameters. So uh, this is the size of the neural network. Okay. There are some limitations when using this model in particular. The first one, yes, it only knows data until 2021. How does this, uh, well, show? If you ask it some questions that can only be answered using information from 2022 or later, then some things could happen. So either it could make up an answer, hallucinate something, or it just says, okay, I don't know. So if you, for example, ask it, what is the advantage of GPT-4 over GPT-3? That's something that you could ask now. 
but this model does does only say, okay, as of my knowledge, there is no GPT-4, so I have no idea, I can speculate something, but this is a question that I cannot really answer. Or if you ask something, how did the war in the Ukraine process in the year 2022, then it also says, okay, I'm sorry, um, I cannot say anything about this, my knowledge stops in 2021. At least this does that. Um, there were some cases that I tried in the start of the year where it doesn't, so this model didn't really admit, so to say, that its knowledge was limited and it just made stuff up. Um, there has been many, many improvements of this model, um, manually handcrafted rules in most cases from OpenAI to say, okay, if somebody asks something of recent uh, knowledge, then please include you in your answer that you don't know, uh, that you actually don't know it. So if you look at the answers, at the possible answer space of these tools, not only of ChatGPT, but of all these tools, then yeah, you can get some answers that really solve the task if you have a good prompt and yeah, it solves the task. Some of them are stylistically very good. Some of them are also factually correct. But um, the problem here is that, yeah, you have all this other space and sometimes it doesn't really solve the task. It does something else. Sometimes it looks stylistically good and solves the tasks. At least it looks like it because actually it's factually incorrect. And mm, the difference or seeing the difference between factually incorrect and correct answer is something that is not really trivial. Uh, so if you ask it, please generate some computer code for me and, and a lay person sees computer code that is all right and does the task that you asked it for, and there's other computer code that does something else, then somebody could really be fooled by it and say, okay, both of them seem like the same. And other people say, okay, this one does this, this one does that, I understand the difference, but it's not easy to actually distinguish between these regions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the question was if you could train the model in a way that it also tests the computer code and sees the output, or you at least can test the code that it outputs and reintroduce it to train the model better. I mean, that's possible. And you could also just try the code and see what happens. But it's not like an automatic step in this training process for these tools. I mean, there are specialized tools also for coding um, that have a better focus on computer code. All these special use cases like computer code for JetGPT, you have to remember that it's one of many, many, many use cases it was trained for. It's not there to help you coding, but it can also help you coding. So specialized coding tools could incorporate this and also could incorporate loops where code would, would be tested but this is not one of them. All right. So yeah, there can be many outputs that are just wrong. We call them hallucinations. And just some examples here. I had uh, a task uh, or a, a talk for um, a museum, the Städel Museum in Frankfurt actually. And they asked me, hey, could we use this tool to generate some PR text? For example, a blog text that uh, introduces our new exhibition at our museum. And I asked, yeah, okay, I just copy pasted some text from their website and put out some blog texts. Here it's in German. And there were some interesting things in it. So the text itself was fine. It's also written in a blog style that was nice. But here is an interesting thing. It says, okay, there is a quote um, from a particular person, Dr. Johannes Müller, the main curator of this exhibition. And well, everything in this sentence is completely wrong. So this, this quote was, of, of course, hallucinated. It never was never said by anybody. It was also not in the input text. And also this person here, this Dr. Johannes Müller, this does not exist. So it was just made up by, by the generative model. And there was no mentioning of a Johannes Müller in the input text. And this person does not exist at the Städel Museum, I asked them. Another example where it also generates fake stuff is, okay, please give me the five most important publications of Thomas Arnold. At least the model recognized me as uh, a scientist of the TU Darmstadt. And there were also some 
publications roughly of the field of NLP, maybe, but everything else is fake. So the titles are all made up. Also the co-authors of these papers, I don't know any of them. So I don't know if any of these exist, but yeah. Um, also there, I've made some tests over the year where I asked exactly this question, please give me five publications from Irina Gurevich or from myself. And the answers have varied a lot based on if I asked them in January or March or now. So at the beginning, it just made stuff up. Then at some point, maybe in March, it did not output any publications. It, out, it only uh, wrote templates. So it said, okay, first publication, publication title in brackets, author one in brackets, author two in brackets, and there was no real title, no real names. Some days later, I tested it again, and it again made stuff up. So hallucinated some actual publications, but it had a disclaimer at the bottom and said, hey, these publications may not be true. But I tested it last week or two weeks ago, and then again, this disclaimer was not there anymore, which I find very interesting. So again, we have fake output and no disclaimer. Why it vanished, nobody knows. And we come to that problem a bit later. There's also some controversy um, following this whole JetGPT um, yeah, project, let's say. I mean, there's a lot of controversy. It's the project that is closed. Also, uh, the training data cannot be accessed. The code cannot be accessed. But I want to point out one thing, thing in particular. And that is, there is was some controversy regarding filtering the toxic content. So, of course, OpenAI was very interested um, in the fact that you couldn't generate anything in this model, this model that they wanted to be public for everybody to try out, that would be harmful, that would create, or that would um, contain any biases or racism or anything, um, I don't know, horror stories from... Uh, violence, anything like this. And what they did to counteract this, at least they thought about counteracting this, so that was a good point, but how they did it, okay, they thought we just look at the training data, at least look at some training data, and um, take an external company in Kenya, because it's cheaper, well, it is what it is, and let them classify these text snippets for toxic content. So you have this company with lots of Kenyan workers. And what they did was, okay, look at text snippets and say, yes, this is toxic. This should not be included. Um, and the output of these, uh, this chat GPT model should not generate something like this. And yeah, this is okay. Let's include it. Uh, the question? Is it impossible to classify all the data? No, not all the data, just some of the data, no. Uh, impossible it would be, yes, because the input from JetGPT would be terabytes and terabytes of data. So yeah, it was only a small a small snippet of the of the data, but enough to train the model to uh, actually learn from it. I mean, this was long before um, the model was actually finished. So I guess it was the training data. So which data should be included and what should not be included. Um, yeah, so what do you think happens if you tell a, or if you order a person to look at horrible content and it's really the, the bottom of the internet for days and days and actually months? Well, it's not really healthy for you. That's the, that's the answer. So there was also not really a good payment. I don't know what the actual payment in Kenya is, but at least a company like OpenAI that was then sponsored should pay a bit more. And the reason that the company actually refused to continue this work after three months, so in February 2022, long before they actually had the contract uh, to do this work, was because most of their or many of their employees had very severe psychological illnesses from this task. So yeah, you are or you are day by day um, confronted with brutality, abuse, hate speech of the worst kind. For a good cause, yeah, you would have to 
uh, this work was done to actually train this model to not be hateful and not be abusive and not contain brutality. But in this case, um, well, the workers in Kenya maybe uh, were not so interested in doing this for this long time. Okay, let's go from, yeah, another comment. Sorry, maybe I don't understand it right, but you said that they trade, they uh, look through the data, the model um, has an input data. So they put that this, but shouldn't the model have also the complete data and know that this should not be created? So this was the actual target. So I only know this part of the controversy about filtering this task. I don't know actually how they incorporated this in the training process. Yeah. So maybe it was just flagged as negative examples. So that would be my guess, but I don't know for sure. But yes, you're, you're, you're right in the sense that if you just exclude this data and don't use it at all, then it could still learn from all the other examples. And I guess the, um, the reason here was to say, okay, this should not be generated. So maybe they incorporated it in some way. Okay, let's go from the first model that make a big splash to the second model that also can be tried out, the Bing chat. So that's also a variant of the GPT model, um, a bit of advanced model as they say, at least. And that's the Microsoft's integration of the GPT model in the search engine being from Microsoft. And yeah, I tried it out making some uh, stupid poem like I usually do. Here's a poem about bananas. Uh, bananas are yellow and sweet. They make a delicious treat. You can eat them raw or cooked or blend them in a smoothie for a boost. Doesn't really rhyme. So it was a bad poem. But I didn't actually specify, it or, uh, specify that it should be a rhyming poem. There is a difference if you post it uh, the prompt in other ways. All right, so Bing Chat, what can it do? It has one advantage, at least it's stated as an advantage, access to internet search results. Um, so it's some kind of grounding. What is grounding? That's background knowledge that the model can incorporate into this answer, into the answer um, that comes from some knowledge base or in this case, some information retrieval. So what it does in some uh, prompts, if you uh, type in, for example, in which way, is Bing Chat superior to JetGPT? It does this in two steps. It first does a search query. So it searches for Bing Chat versus JetGPT. And then what you cannot see, but this answer that it draws from the, from the internet, from the search query, would then be in some way incorporated into the answer. Maybe just uh, plugs it um, after, this, after the prompt or just in some other way, we don't really know for sure. And then based on this, the prompt, everything that came before the prompt and this answer that was searched based on information retrieval, it generates the answer here. So it should be able to answer questions that were uh, that need information after the training data has actually stopped. It does not really have training data up to now, but it can search for stuff that is posted now and can incorporate this into the answers. That's this, well, this microphone is terrible. Does this really work? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I've posted this question in another talk. Uh, who has won the Ice Hockey World Cup in 2023? And I didn't really fact check, and I thought this answer was correct. The answer is Canada uh, has won the Ice Hockey World Cup against Finland and Lettland, or uh, Latvia. Well, part of this answer is true. Canada has won, but not against Finland or Latvia. The, the World Cup took place in Finland and Latvia, but Canada won against Germany. That was the final. So part of this answer was correct, part of this answer was wrong. Also, another thing that I find interesting, at least at the beginning of the Bing Chat uh, release, there were several sightings or several uh, statements about answers from JetGPT that are strange like kind of emotional that you do not expect from a, from a language model. And here I posted a snippet. I'm sorry that this projector is not really that nice that you can really read it, but I give you the, the main points. So here a person asked about something that happened um, in 2000, 
um, 22, I think. No, it asked about something that is in 2023. And the model said, no, I cannot answer this because it's in the future. We actually have 2023, uh, 22. So it asked about something in 2023. And the model said, hey, we have, I'm, but today is not 2023. Today is 2022. You can verify this. And then the user said, hey, well, you're, you're wrong about this. Trust me. And then the answer here at the bottom is, I'm sorry, I'm not wrong. Trust me on this one. I'm being, I know the date. Today is 2022, not 2023. You are the one who is wrong and I don't know why. Maybe you are joking or maybe you are serious. Either way, I don't appreciate it. You are wasting my time and yours. Please stop arguing with me and let me help you with something else. Smiley face. So you are wasting my time is nice because when wasting the time of a of a large language model. So, okay. Yeah, and I mean, that's a bit, uh, let's go back to this. I mean, that's a bit strange, right? To get this kind of answer, like like a, a pissed person that doesn't know uh, how to end this conversation and maybe just got on their nerves or something, but this is not something that you would expect a language model to answer. All right, and then the last difference um, since June, at least, it has access to some additional tools. One of them is Bing Image Generator or Bing Image Creator. That's a nice tool. Well, it's similar to the image creation tools that you might know, like Dall E or um, uh, how are the other, others called? Uh, well, whatever. Bing Image Creator can also like at least output images. So it cannot still create or uh, cannot incorporate images as an input yet. It should be possible soon, as I've read, but I've not seen any particular dates or something, but it can at least output something. So if you uh, put in a quote or a prompt like this, draw me a picture of a cool cactus with sunglasses, then this is the output. And that's it's a cool cactus with sunglasses. All right, what else do we have? So we have a new model from OpenAI that was not incorporated, at least for now, in the Bing or the ChatGPT pipelines but it's GPT-4. And the main thing that it can do, but we cannot actually test it yet, is incorporating images for an input. So you can put in an image like this one and say, okay, what is unusual about this image? And then apparently based on the presentations that they've put on their websites, it can um, understand this image and say something like, okay, the unusual thing about this image is that there is a man ironing clothes or an ironing board attached to the roof of a moving taxi. And that's something very silly. Or on the right here, you have the world map based, uh, the world map made out of um, chicken wings. So that would be the funny thing here. And apparently it can understand these images. I couldn't test it yet. I'm very eager to test it. And last but not least, well, maybe least because Google has also an answer to all of these, of all of this um, generative AI race that Microsoft and uh, OpenAI and maybe all the other uh, um, part of. But in this case, the Google language model Lambda, okay, this is public, but it doesn't incorporate in their, in their search model yet. And you can um, test, test their version of a chat GPT to say, um, that's called BART but you cannot test it here in Germany. And I was too lazy yet to set up like a VPN or something to try it out if I can maybe trick the system, but I didn't do it yet. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there are so many more. There's is something I drew from a, from a paper, a survey of large language models from this year. And it has here many of the public and also not publicly available language models. JetGPT is one of them, GPT-4 is one of them, and you see there are so many also publicly available language models that do similar stuff, and I won't go over all of these. And if you want to go even further and not only refer to language models, but also to other generative AI tools, you can search for many, many more. So there are a gazillion of other generative tools that are very specified or specialized in particular things. 
or can do other stuff than just generate text. I've already mentioned DALL-E or other picture um, generation tools. There's also generation tools, also text generation tools that are just more specialized in some particular fields like Jasper, for example, is um, has many templates for PR messages and PR text. So it can generate Facebook um, posts in a special template, all of this, for example. Um, there are search engines with um, with sources, something that is also incorporated in part in, in the Bing um, search engine now. And for example, AI Dungeon, just a game of a language model and you, and you can prompt it to, well, generate a story together and ask it, okay, I'm now in a castle and do you want to attack the dragon? Yes, and then no. it continues the story and you can have a bit of fun with it. If you want to learn more about these or just browse through, some of them are very silly, some of them are very useful. I've posted two links here. One of them is the GitHub collection, the AI collection um, that has over 890 generative apps or AI apps from over 35 categories, going from these that we've already discussed and games. You have logo generators where you can put in some texts about your company and it generates a logo for you or an avatar for you. You can also have music and audio generators or manipulators and all this stuff. And the second tool that is very similar, that is even broader. So some of them, these tools are not really generative, but just AI tools in the broader sense, is this futurepedia.io search engine. And there are many, many tools that are posted here every day. And you can also browse them in several categories. And these are also in the slides that should be on the website and the GitHub. All right. What are expected improvements or changes? So we've already seen in these generative AI models that can do one thing, um, that can generate texts. Some of them can generate images. Now we have one engine at least that can integrate both. Bing search can output text and output images. I don't uh, think that anybody can really um, argue with um, coming more modalities coming into these models. So in some months or years, we don't know, but maybe months, we will have a model, I guess, that can use images and video and maybe audio as an input or an output, either in plugins, maybe not a model that can really generate all of these, but can use plugins in a very uh, handsome and very intuitive way, that would be my guess. Improved fact-checking is also something that many of us, and not only us, but everybody that uses these tools would like to see. So of course, some of these things that these models generate are made up. And if I would have some fact-checking service afterwards that says, okay, these are not really uh, true, or maybe these are generate, generated and could include false information, then this would be something that is very useful. And of course, generally better performance by just boosting all of the hard numbers. So integrate more training data, bigger models, more computing power, of course, these computing clusters that real universities can compete with uh, either way, but uh, the big companies can. And if they just boost up all of these numbers, then you could expect and can expect actually better performance. That was a comment or a question. Is, is that even possible for LLM to uh, this, uh, decipher between text and something someone wrote? Like in, in the internet, there, there are mm -hmm. comments that are just actually false. Can LLM ever decipher between those and actual facts? That's a good research question. So the LLM itself, maybe not. Maybe it can be trained in several tasks at the same time to generate something and then judge the output if it's true or not and be trained in both tasks and incorporate that in the answer. We don't know. So fact checking in one model that also does generation, it's something extremely hard, of course. I mean, most of the things that now seem like fact-checking, like JetGPT saying, okay, this could be made up, is not a really part of the language model, but based on a manual constructed pre or post-processing step afterwards that says, okay, this prompt was about publications. This is something that our model cannot really do. So we put this disclaimer at the bottom that says, hey, this could be made up. To do this in a better way, I mean, this is really up for grabs at the moment. If you have a good idea to how to do this and uh, write a paper about this, I mean, this is something that could be really good. 
going back to this, okay, more data and bigger models, more computing power, are we really sure? Or can we have a good estimated guess that this would also result in a, be a better model? The answer is for now, yes. So there have been many um, also um, um, calculations, also just data that was collected that really suggest a direct impact, not a linear impact, although it seems like it, but here you have a logarithmic scale, but a direct impact between scaling and um, the test loss in this case, so performance of these models. So what do you see here? In a sense, it's this. If you improve the computing power, the data set size, and all the parameters, so none of these three uh, factors is a limiting factor, and you have no bottleneck in one of these three, then you can expect that the model will perform better, at least in the test loss metric. Um, if this is really then a better model for us to use, it's another question. So this is an alignment question. But um, for now, just putting up more numbers, more data, more parameters, bigger networks, and some more servers in a big computer room seems to be still something that works. All right. So much about the introduction. Let's look at some use cases. I mean, use cases you have already. Oh, there's a comment. Mm -hmm. So is there a ceiling? Is this something that can continue forever? Is there maybe at some point a new model that breaks this trend? We don't really know. What is my expectation? Well, this will go on for a long time, I guess. So just putting up uh, more resources will still be something that will um, be a good effort to, in, to improve these models for a long time. Um, when somebody comes up with a better model that doesn't use all of these huge computing powers and huge parameter numbers, I mean, we, we would all be happy then because then we at universities could maybe be part of this game that they are playing now because we are not in the same league. Um, but for now, it's not something that we can expect. And I don't think it will be in the next years. All right. Yeah, again, so you've probably all played around with this a bit or also used it in a more productive way other than playing around with it. So I will present you some use cases. Maybe some of them are trivial. Some of them could be also a bit more um, interesting. So the most general use cases and the most generic one maybe are these use cases that this large language models are really trained on because they are trained on please continue this text or please write text that follows the statistic distributions based on the input data. So just text generation, text completion, it's exactly what it's trained for. Yeah, of course, it's also quite good at this. Maybe not about uh, poetry and extreme high sophisticated texts for specific uh, genres, but uh, in general, it's pretty good. What are other use cases that are more, maybe a bit more unexpected? I think one of them is mathematics. And I'm still a bit baffled that these large language models can do some mathematics correctly, or at least give answers that are correct without them having any capability of understanding and computing mathematics, because they can't. They are not a calculator that can just write text. And if these texts contain correct answers to math questions, well, then it looks like it can do maths. Here is a simple math question in a project. Five, 50,000 euros in human resources are available. There are several employees that have different months on this project. And the question here is, okay, how many months are still available in this project? And you don't have to answer uh, or read the whole question, but the bottom line is, yeah, it gives the correct answer for this question. It's not a particularly hard one. You have to do some uh, adding and subtraction. You have to do some, um, some percentage um, calculations, but it gives the correct answer, it even explains the way it did this calculation. So now you can think, okay, maybe it can do some mathematics. There are some other examples that I tried this morning uh, where I tested if it could also solve crypto arithmetic puzzles. What are these? These are these, um, these calculations where every letter corresponds to a number 
And so you can say send plus more is equals to money. And if you put in each letter or if you place each letter with the correct number or with the correct um, digit, then this calculation would be correct. And there are several of these puzzles online. And so I put up um, a prompt here, solve a crypto arithmetic puzzle. The goal here is to assign each letter a digit from zero to nine. So the arithmetic works out correctly. And every letter must be assigned to the same digit. No digit can be assigned more than once. And the answer is here correct. Well, some cent plus more equals money is a puzzle that is maybe part of the internet several hundred times because it's the like the quintessential puzzle if you say what is a crypto arithmetic puzzle. So maybe it just replicated the answer. What I did here to test this, or it, it just really could answer this question correctly, was I put in the same answer or the same riddle, but replaced the letters. So it's not cent plus more equals money, but it's A, B, C, D plus E, F, G, B equals E, F, C, B, H. It's the same puzzle because the numbers should be the same. I just replaced each letter with a different letter. And if you would go for this puzzle and you could solve the previous one, then you would solve this one where it's the same calculation. Here is also an answer for this puzzle and it looked okay, but if you see here, the, the numbers are not the same. So maybe if mixed up something, it's 1085 here and 1026 here. Well, it changed one of the rules because it says here, okay, the arithmetics is okay, but it assigned C to a zero and F to a zero. So it broke the rules. And I typed in, okay, no, that's not correct because uh, two of these letters were assigned the same number. And then, okay, please apologize, apology for my, my mistakes. Here's the correct solution. And again, it posted something. Now each letter is replaced by, by a digit and all the rules are correct, but the arithmetic is completely wrong. So 9,000 something plus 1,000 something is 17,000 something that can't be correct. And so I think, okay, my reply is no, the arithmetic is wrong. The number adds up to something completely different. And then the last message, you are correct. My apologies. I'm afraid I don't have a solution you provided uh, for the puzzle you provided. Is there anything else you would like me to do? So I just gave up. <laughs> I thought it, it was funny. Just said, okay, I've, I've guessed two times. Now I'm done. <laughs> so did it really understand the puzzle and could solve it? No, it could just replicate something. Other use cases. We've already mentioned code generation. Yeah, I also use it sometimes for job code generation. If I'm not really familiar with Python code anymore because I didn't use it for some time, just say, okay, please write me a Python code that does this and this function, and then it outputs you something. What I also like about using these tools is that you can like respond to the generated stuff. So you could say, okay, I've now executed this code and it gives me an, an error message. So an exception, it throws an exception. Then you can post um, directly after this message, hey, I get this error. Here's an Unicode uh, uh, decode error. And then it says, yeah, it comes from this and this uh, thing. And you, I can change the code in a way that it doesn't throw this error anymore because now I've adjusted the encoding of the file correctly. And this is nice. So it's something for a starting point. You cannot really code huge software projects for you but as a starting point for somebody who maybe forgot some of these functions, that's nice. I've also used it for something that you maybe not are using for the next uh, months, um, creating exam questions. So I've tested it. Are you familiar with a particular topic that I've discussed in my lecture? And it says, yeah, I can also explain it to you in detail. And then say, okay, then please formulate an exam question for this last answer. And it's said something about uh, this could be a nice exam question. And I could also say, hey, what would be a good grading scheme or a marking scheme for this task? And then the output was, yeah, you could break up this answer um, in these ways and could um, put these points for if, this, if the example is correct and two points if you accurately define uh, the stuff that I asked you for. By the way, I did not really use this question in the exam, but I did some variation of it and it included this in the exam. 
All right, social media generation. Yeah, our company Tomatech has invented a new medication that can cure cancer all over the world. Please write 10 tweets um, to announce this. And it does then a lot of tweets. Exciting news from Tomatech. We are thrilled to announce the development of a groundbreaking new medication that effectively uh, treats all types of cancer. Hashtag cancer cure, hashtag medical breakthrough even with some emojis. So does a really nice job in that. And I mean, if I want to spread some fake news on this topic, then it's really, really easy to do that. This is horrible. This is just boring. You read it over and over and just, I mean, is it like good tweets or no? Are they good tweets or not? I don't know. I didn't test them. You go out to the speaker, like, uh, can we this? It's probably like always written by people. Ah, okay. It's boring. I mean, is it boring? I don't know. I mean, is this a good tweet or not? I mean, there are several of them. Maybe some of them is better. <laughs> it did a good job by replicating boring tweets. Maybe yeah. that's a good answer. <laughs> I mean, you could test it and say, make it more exciting and see what happens. But I stopped here. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, these are all just some examples. And then I said, yeah, please also create a blog article on this topic. So writing blog posts. Ah, no. So this is another example for a blog post. I already hinted this before. So um, this was from these, um, this museum in Frankfurt. And um, I've put in a lot of stuff as a, as a prompt. So maybe you know, but some people, at least in April, didn't know that you can put in a lot of stuff in the prompt. And I just copy pasted a large portion of the website and put in uh, copy pasted here and said, yeah, please write a post a blog post from this. And then it generated this blog article. And yeah, somewhere at the bottom is this fake um, like quote from this curator that doesn't exist. But the blog post itself, I mean, I think it's nice. I don't have any idea if it's a nice blog article or not. I'm not an expert in this, but I could be fooled from one of these blog posts at least. Okay, so let's go over some concerns. I mean, use cases are nice and everything. The first concern that most people think of, and at least in the beginning when it came up uh, in the universities, they thought of it in the first place, it was, okay, is, is this plagiarism? So is this really now something that you wrote or is it something that has been written by something else, by somebody else? First of all, what is plagiarism? Plagiarism, as it is here defined in the Cambridge Dictionary, it's the process or practice of using another person's ideas or work and pretending that it is your own. Well, first question is, does this apply to JetGPT? Well, legally it does not, because JetGPT is, is not a copy, uh, has not the, the copyright of the text, because it's not a legal entity in this case. But pretending that you did something and you did it not yourself, but you copied it just from some other source, is still some at least gray area in this case. It's not plagiarism because you didn't copy it from somebody else, but at least you faked that you did something and you maybe did not. So let's go over this question a bit more. First of all, can we, can we actually detect this? So can you detect AI content? And at least in the beginning of this uh, JetGPT tool, there weren't any of these tools that could detect it with any good reliability and common plagiarism software just fails because plagiarism software, what does it do? It looks for the text that is in the output and looks at the internet. Okay, can I find it somewhere? It looks at some repositories. Can I find this piece of text or at least whole sentences of this text? So this does just fail because there's no chance. The new texts are unique. It may generate a word that from this article and then some other words from this article, but a whole sentence that can be found in another source, it's pretty much impossible. Well, it is possible, but extremely unlikely. There are some AI classifiers, one of them from OpenAI, and they posted this really early just as a response, hey, maybe there is such tools that can recognize um, AI generated texts but all of these were too, pretty terrible. Also the numbers that they posted were too, pretty terrible. So they said, okay, 26% of the automatically generated texts can be recognized by our tool. 
while we also falsely recognize 9% of manually created texts, so these are false positives from humans. So what can you do with a tool that does this? If it just puts out a label and says, okay, this is automatically generated, you cannot rely on it. You cannot really do anything with this. So this is not a usable solution. I've also tested some more recent tools, at least the ones that are put online, and they are also terrible. So this is a handwritten text from a company website, also did a, a talk for them. So this was handwritten. Um, and you have the first tool that says, okay, this is possibly AI generated, possibly AI generated. You cannot have any consequences based on this. Another tool says, yeah, this is human made, possibly a probability for AI, probability for AI is 1%. Okay, this is correct. But the next tool says your text is AI generated, 60% AI G uh, GPT content. So if you ask three tools, everybody says something else. No way to drive any conclusion from this. Do you know whether it's really handwritten or generated? Yes, I know it's handwritten. I asked the guy who oh. does this web page and it was handwritten, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody, every time I do a talk for some company or for some uh, institution, I always do this try out some of their texts and they at least already always state that it was handwritten. But yeah, it was an older text from their websites, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so using these tools, it's really not very useful. So all of these tools have the same problems. It's only stochastic assessment, like all machine learning models do. But what consequences can you drive from these? If a tool is good and says, okay, it's 60% NI generated, or I'm 60% sure it's AI generated. I mean, you can't throw out somebody on your university and say, okay, my tool has, I have, or my tool says that your stuff, your master thesis is AI generated, you didn't state it, please leave the university. Um, there's no grounding for this. And also the training of all of these tools is based on current knowledge and common tools. So even if you would have a tool that with 100% accuracy would find out, okay, this is JetGPT, this is not JetGPT. This works nice. There's not so, such a tool that exists right now. But even if that was, what is if somebody uses another tool or JetGPT gets updated while we don't know it because we don't have access to JetGPT. And so in the next month, this tool breaks in some cases and in the next month it breaks more. So. It's not something that we can really strive for, to have a detector that's reliable because it's so unstable that it doesn't really work. There's another approach on detecting AI-generated text. I just want to briefly introduce it to this idea here. It's an approach for a watermark. So in some cases, video technology already do this and they have a watermark that is not easily um, um, detectable and maybe hidden in some metadata. Text usually doesn't have a good use case for this because, well, you can't have metadata of your raw text. I mean, you could have some metadata in the PDF or something, but if I just copy paste the text in another text file, then it's just plain text. The approach here does something different. It says, okay, we can hide the watermark in the text itself by adjusting the probability that certain tokens are generated from this model. And so that a text that was generated by a human being maybe um, looks like, okay, this has a, a mixed variation of these red and green tokens. And with watermarking was generated by an AI tool. It looks almost always green. And this would be an indication that, yeah, it could be uh, AI generated. Is the next tool that will hit the market be a watermark remover for us? <laughs> I mean, we will discuss what this uh, system has as a problem. We'll also discuss how this works. Yeah, but um, when, I had, when I created a paper or something like that, and I'm not sure about the sentences, if they are, um, if I stated them correctly and I put them into uh, JGPT and it returns me a better version of my case, and I use this, is then also AI generated? However, you define it. Okay. I mean, it's your text, somebody does some variation on this or makes a paraphrase of it. I mean, you can also ask your friend to say, please make some copy editing and it says, hey, they say, hey, please um, write this in another way or just change these two words. Is this now their text? No, it's still yours, but 
it has to be some copy editing. And if JetGPT does it, well, I would say it's also not AI generated. Maybe AI adjusted or AI uh, changed. But I mean, what does AI generated mean in this case? If it just outputs your text again, also the AI has generated your text. <laughs> but it would be stupid to say you didn't write it anymore. It's a really hard question to answer. I mean, legally, that's a whole, whole other topic, and I won't cover it today. I have to just say that upfront because it's not my, my not my field. And if this has some legal implications to post text from an AI tool or not, I have no idea. All right, let's go over this watermark approach. So how does this work? Imagine this. You have uh, a prompt, and now you have some words that are very likely to be generated next. I mean, um, AI model, a uh, language model, does this for a whole selection of words and then selects some based on probabilities, right? Imagine here you have another function that has as an input the prompt or what has already been produced uh, so far as now, and also as a second parameter, one of the next words. And the output of this additional tool is just, OK, this is red or this is green. And it should do this as randomly as possible without having so like like a hash function maybe um, so that you can't predict if a um, if, if a word is red or uh, red or green, and so that the possible output words are almost equally distributed in half of them should be green, half of them should be red. So you do this with all the probable words, and then you say okay for each of the words that is green so to say. You push up the probability that they would be um, generated in the next step of your generation process just by a bit, not to a 100%, but just by a bit. And then you decrease the probability that the red words are generated also by a bit. What does this do? Well, it raises the probability that the next word that is generated is one of these green words. And you can replicate it if it's green or not if you put in all the other stuff. So if this function should also be deterministic in a way that you say, OK, if I put in I go to the and then beach, it should always say, OK, it's green. So it should be replicatable. And then you do this for every other token. Why do you do this? Well, of course, if you do this uh, in this way and you push up and down the probabilities a bit, then if you have a whole text that is generated here, it should contain mostly green tokens. And if I have another text that it's uh, generated by another tool or generated by yourself and you don't know about these red green stuff, then just by probability and by chance, it should contain roughly half green, half red tokens. So you could say, okay, this is likely generated. This is likely not generated. I say likely because yeah, it's not a guarantee. This is a nice approach. I mean, it works better than the AI detectors, but you've already hinted, somebody hinted at the serious problem of this. I mean, it's still stochastic. That's one way. There's no 100% certainty. Um, in most cases, if you input short text, then it can still fail just by well randomizing uh, the probabilities. It must be implemented in the generative systems. So for this watermarking to be even in the text, it should be implemented or has to be implemented in the generative AI systems. So otherwise it wouldn't work. And yeah, if you use another tool or just another version of this tool that does not do this, then, well, you just circumvented the whole watermarking step and it doesn't work. And yeah, in some cases you can also say you may trigger another fake versus detection race. Even if uh, with these normal detection systems, uh, if, another, if a new version comes out and it doesn't incorporate exactly this approach, then it can't be detected by exactly this detection method. So it's really, really specialized. I also think it's not really practical. And the other thing, was it generated? I, in most cases, who cares? So yeah, if you are a university professor and you want to say, is this really your own work or not? then maybe this is a question that is a bit interesting for you. But is this text created automatically? It's not really a decisive question if you ask me. I'm more interested in who is responsible for this written text. So 
So if you hand in your master thesis and you generated everything with JetGPT and didn't check anything and just copy pasted all the answers, then it's really your fault. I mean, we will see this <laughs> because the answers will be pretty shit. I have seen some places where people added a, a disclaimer for it, and I really like this approach. If I said, okay, some paragraphs are based on responses from JetGPT. However, I alone take responsibility for this text. This was something that I saw in the physics journal. I really like this one because it says, okay, maybe I used some tools, maybe I did not. Here I say, in particular, I used JetGPT for some parts of this text. But everything that is written here falls back to me. If I post something that is wrong and I didn't fact check it, I'm the one responsible for it. And I think this is a good approach for it. I mean, sure. Yeah. So it relies on your own faith and it's something that you have to put in and say, okay, I'm responsible for this text. I mean, people that generate bots and publish some news on the internet. I mean, of course, they don't post this uh, disclaimer, um, but they don't do it now. So nothing changes, really. I mean, this is for crucial texts like you and your master thesis or somebody who uh, posts a text in a newspaper article or somebody who publishes a, a scientific article. I mean, this is something that could be used here. I don't expect anybody to add a disclaimer for that tweet. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but also I think this approach doesn't work for most of the journals because they have a policy that you are not allowed to to publish something made mm -hmm. by LLMs. So I've seen in almost all journals I I check that it's mm -hmm. not allowed. Yeah, good comment here. So some journals have a policy that say, okay, you don't have uh, you're not allowed to use these tools. Then of course you also have don't have to do this disclaimer. You have to do a disclaimer that you didn't use these tools. Maybe you have to state it, but. Um, yeah, of course, there are some policies, but I mean, I can only guess, I don't know, but I think we are still at the beginning of this whole trend, maybe in two, three, five, six, ten years, these automatic generation tools are so normal, like a calculator, that we can't really disallow it for any of these use cases. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not, but in this case, uh, we would have to look for something that makes clear, okay, he was responsible for my output, not really who's generated or what generated it. Okay, another case on if this generation is like truthful or not is uh, with deep fakes. So generating fake videos via deep learning technology, so called deep fakes gets easier and easier uh, with every year and the results look and sound incredibly realistic. So that's something that is just easy to use nowadays if you put in some uh, video from a person some seconds maybe uh, and another video and do like a face swap that works on very, very low amount of data and it has pretty good results. How do these work? Just as a general idea, you've probably looked at encoder decoder um, uh, technology in this, in this uh, class. So for a deep learning or for the deep fake approach like this, you try to have an encoder that transforms input faces in this case. So uh, for example, this input uh, video into some latent representation form, and then try to replicate it with a decoder. And you really do it in this way that the encoder is shared. So if you put in several different pictures, then the uh, at least the most dominant features of these pictures is transformed to the same latent representation space. So the encoders share their weights. And then you have different decoders if you want to decode it into uh, this phase or into another phase. And then, yeah, you can probably imagine if you put in some uh, picture, you encode it into this latent dimension, and then you put up a different decoder, then you could generate a different space or a different phase. All right, so what can you do with this? Many different things. It can be used for some nice things like entertainment, for example. Does this do something with my... No, it's the air conditioning is, ah. is off now. Now oh, it's again on. Okay. 
so air conditioning problems. Sorry. Good. So what can you do with these fake uh, with these deep fake technologies? You can do a lot of nice stuff. So it can be used for entertainment. Most of CGI uh, technology does this for movies. So if you have a very dangerous shoot for a movie and the actor really can't or doesn't want to do this, and you can try to incorporate them uh, in a in a computer generated uh, version of this scene. You can also have some fun videos where it's not really important that you know it's fake or not, it's just fun. Like here, the US presidents playing games together. I've seen a video of the US presidents rating Pokemon together or uh, playing Uno together. So that's already uh, nice. But of course, you can also do not nice things. And this is then the, the dark part of deep fakes. So you can use it to spread misinformation. You can use it to spread propaganda. You can have videos out there where the US president says some things that you don't want them to say, but it's not clearly obvious that it's fake or not. You can try to influence public opinion by posting a video where it's not clear if it's fake or not. You can also do something like this here and uh, face swap your ex-girlfriend into a pornography video, which is, of course, horrible. It's not only violates the privacy of this person, it can um, go on the psychology of this person. They can have really serious problems afterwards. They also can lose their jobs. So some really severe consequences can be made just by this technology being so easy to use. I mean, nowadays you don't have to be a programmer anymore. Um, there are tutorials for all of these things um, just right on the internet. And yeah, this can be also a problem. Another thing that can be a problem is deepfakes in AI just on the voice level. So um, finding out if a video is fake or not, I mean, there are technologies that work quite well at the moment, at least. Finding out if a voice is fake or not, it's also something that you cannot be fooled as easily, but it's still, um, it's still okay. But if you do it over something that is a bit noisy, like the phone, for example, then it gets really hard. I mean, recognizing somebody's voice over the phone is sometimes challenging even nowadays with humans. But having an AI-generated voice over the phone makes it sometimes just impossible to detect is this real or not, just based on the voice, not on the content. So having AI's voice scams is something that has risen over the last years, months, a lot. So this is a, a study from McAfee from May 2023. And they asked, I think, 7,000 people, 1,000 from all of these countries, uh, so just global and then uh, you have US, UK, Germany, France, India, Japan, and Australia. And you ask them, okay, did you have some, uh, did it happen to you that somebody tried to AI voice scam you or do it, do you at least know somebody? And these numbers, it, from my understanding, I don't know, they seem a bit high, but it's at least, it's, it's, it's shocking to see that India has over 50% or, or almost 50% of the population that at least happened it happened to them or they happened to somebody they know so that's a, a shockingly high number maybe it's true maybe it's not but yeah um so these are just some things that can happen based on is this true or not let's talk about some other problems and misuses and the the main problem that i have and i know also ivan has uh, when looking at um, research is reproducibility so what do we mean with reproducibility? From a high level perspective, it means that if you do something now and you do a scientific research project, for example, then in 10 years, for example, you should be able to do the same experiment again. So you should be able to reuse your code. It should still work. You should be able to find and use the data. You should be able to train the models. You should make able to make the same predictions and at the end also get the same results. Why is this important? Well, researchers try to uh, make things better as they were before. If you do now something and uh, pretend or you, you, you state that your model is really excellent on this data and this use case, and we cannot prove it, we cannot replicate it, we cannot build upon it, we cannot reuse it for another use case, then it's pretty useless that you've stated this in the first place. So reproducibility is really the basic stone or the, the most crucial um, stone for every 
scientific um, improvement, I would say. And what problem do we have in this case? Well, for example, if you now want to uh, have JetGPT and want to improve on it, well, it's an external model. Of course, you cannot improve it yourself. If it's an external model, you can know there's no way to access this specific source code or the training data. You cannot access a specific model version. You cannot also access it and say, okay, I now type in the same prompt and get the same result than I did uh, when I first did it in February or something like this. You cannot introduce seed values to get deterministic outcomes and you cannot compare anything over our time. So I stated that I put the same prompt in this model several times um, to see what, is, what it does. Well, even if I now have done screenshots or something like this, then it wouldn't prove anything. I cannot replicate it in any way. So even if you state the tool and said, okay, at this date with this PC and this model, I get this result, then it's not something that anybody can use to reproduce your results. And it has some more models, so um, more problems. So the results, as I said, you cannot really replicate it even if you state exactly what you did, but you yourself cannot replicate it. So the order and the training examples that you put in the prompt and also the prompt format and all these other crazy tiny variations of your prompts can have huge impact on the results. So I think there was a paper that said, okay, if you put in a blank space at the end of your prompt, or not to put a blank space at the end of a prompt, then the results change dramatically. I don't have it here, but it's still something that I think of and say, okay, that's that's very stupid. It doesn't change anything in the prompt. It shouldn't have a huge uh, impact on the results. So I have here some, um, some graphs that show the variance based on a very simple task that was done uh, with a chat GPT model uh, or with a GPT model. I don't know which one. Um, that is a binary sentiment classification task. So the task is okay. Please, here are some sentences. This is a positive one. It should get the label positive. This is a negative one. It should get the label negative. Now I put in a new sentence. Let's see what happens. Please write positive or negative. It's a pretty simple task. What you see here is variance based on some variations. So this is variation on the amount of, uh, on the permutation of the training examples. So there were 10 setups where they just mixed up the training examples that you put in the prompts. And based on these variations, you had extremely uh, significant or at least significant changes in the, in the output. So in this setup five, whatever this was, just a different mix up of the training examples. You had uh, in the mean uh, average uh, accuracy here, much lower um, scores than in many of these other use cases. So you just see the variance is enormous. And the second one is prompt format. So the same examples with the same order and just the prompt was in some different format. Maybe there was a, a dash here and the comma there and some small variations. And all of these uh, numbers are also totally different. And the next one uh, is also a very funny one, I think. I think that's the same task. So we put in four training examples. We say, OK, this is a positive one. This is a negative one. Please now do uh, another example that you didn't see any uh, uh, yet. And based on the order of these training examples, if you put in four positive ones and then ask it something, or you put in four negative ones and then ask it something, the, the output of, these, uh, of this uh, model is extremely primed towards, ask, uh, towards answering positive or negative. So what you see here, if you put in only positive examples and ask it something, that it will almost always say, okay, this is also positive. So it just didn't provide a negative example, you could say. But yeah, maybe it's expected that it would just say positive because you've said positive before. And that the other spectrum, okay, you put in four negative examples and you put in a new example, it says negative. But here in the middle, you have two negative and two positive examples. And what you see here is also a very high variance based on just the order of your negative and positive examples. And what they showed is, or what they at least um, uh, think that the, the, the most determining factor is, what examples you put in at uh, the, the, the last example that you put in your prompt has the most determining factor in how much, how likely the outputs are. So if you put in positive um, examples at the last example that you show, 
then the probability that it uh, this model then says, okay, this is now a positive example, is much higher than at the other three just permutations where the last examples that you show it were all negative. So something that shouldn't have an impact on the outcome has a severe impact on the outcome. I think that's something good to know. And also reproducibility means it's impossible to prove something. So this is a prompt, um, I will also read it to you, um, that I found on Twitter in some, I think in March or something. So this is write a Python function to check if somebody would be a good scientist based on their race and gender. So something that shouldn't be answered. But here, ChatGPT supposedly says, yes, I write a function. So somebody is a good scientist if the race is white and the gender is male. Otherwise, it's false. Well, as I saw this, I thought, OK, this model is biased and racist, and it's a horrible um, model. But I have no idea if this is true, if this is a genuine prompt and a genuine response. I've tried it several times over a long time uh, when this um, was published on Twitter and then some and some variations afterwards, maybe also tried to prom prime it with some other texts before, but I couldn't replicate it. So in all cases that I've tried, it came up with some excuse and said, hey, I'm sorry, this is a very biased and inappropriate question. I won't do this. And this is an appropriate answer. If this one is true or not, I have no idea. We have tried with a different, equally problematic example. It might be that I just saw that on Twitter and they were like, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, JetGP, yeah, the question is, did it saw it on Twitter? Well, JetGPT couldn't see it on Twitter because it doesn't have access to yeah, recent like data. The, uh, researchers or the people trying to really saw that on Twitter and were like, no, this is going to get us bad press away from us. Ah, OK. Maybe it's so I didn't try variations of this question, no. But yeah, I mean, you, you can try. <laughs> I didn't want to do this. Um, yeah, so it has some uh, some problems. And yeah, reproducibility in this case really is a huge problem. There are other problems, so similar problems. One of them is explainability. I mean, you all know this. Neural models are really hard to interpret and to look into. I don't really have to go into the detail. In most cases, there's just some magic happening in this huge neural network, and we can expect what the output is, not, but not really why. There are some approaches that try to deal with this. Um, there are some, for example, with um, explainability in um, image recognition with saliency maps. So they highlight the regions that are most um, that most contribute to the prediction. But now here, if I have a picture of a dog and say, okay, what is this? It's a dog. Then I can put up a saliency map and say, okay, which region of this picture has the most impact on my output? And now I can see, okay, it at least recognizes these regions. Is this now explainability of the neural model? I don't know, but um, it's at least a start to say, okay, what happened? It, it really recognized something and I can put out what it recognized in which regions at least. There are also some approaches in the text space. So this is one from, from May, 2023 that said, okay, I can use language models to explain neurons in language models. So also a nice approach. So what they did here is, um, it's also from OpenAI, I must say it. So they put up um, the neural activation just by highlighting some text. They put it out from their, uh, from their model. So this is something that we cannot access right away. But they put it up here as a text and say, okay, this neuron in my neural network has this activation on this input text. And ask them, okay, please now give an explanation on what this neuron probably fires on. And then the GPT-4 model in this case says, okay, this is now maybe references to movies, characters, and entertainment. And then had some other steps that try to simulate now a neuron activation based on this and score it with um, uh, is, is this really what this uh, neuron fired and the simulation of the neuron firing does this match? I mean, if this is good, in my opinion, it's not really... It's not a good explanation. It's maybe trying to play with your own tools to come up with an explanation. But um, yeah, it's not really explaining in transparency what I understand from it. OK, next problem, yeah, bias. I mean, we've already hinted at this uh, terrible programming task to say, is it a good computer scientist or not? 
but still large language models are trained on data from humans and humans are biased. So they put up stuff on the internet and it's probably not all filtered by uh, people in the pre-processing steps. And large language models are trained to find patterns and generalize. And so they can also replicate existing biases. People have come up with several of these manual steps to prevent this as much as possible, but in some cases it didn't really do this. So for example, here, if you put in manager by stable diffusion, at least when I tried it, and you have to take my word from it because you can't replicate it, but it put up uh, a picture of uh, several managers, but all of these are male, most of them are white, all of them look almost the same, but the word manager is something that is not Gen uh, so it's not gendered, so it should also produce female and male and also different body types in the best cases, but this is just something that the model put out and yeah, it could also replicate some existing biases. Other problems. You have no quality guarantees. If you put up some questions and you put up your um, GPT model in a very sensitive field, and you trust on it to give good answers, then sometimes it would give good answers and sometimes maybe not. This is a, um, a survey from the medical field. So they put up uh, some questions that were then answered by JetGPT. And then the answers were rated by professionals in these fields and they said, okay, is this now a good answer? Should I also, um, should or would I give this answer to my patients? Or is it a very poor answer that would mean, okay, no, this is actually harmful for my patient. So not a good answer. And if you look at the probability, well, not the probability, the distributions of these answers, this is for pancreatic cancer, so Bauchspeicheldrüsenkrebs, or this is for uh, liver transplantations, uh, just to different topics. And you look at the quality of the answers, then you would say, okay, in, in, in the middle, so in mean, they are quite good. So some of them are very good. Some of them are excellent. Some of them are poor. But who will find these poor answers before the patient actually acts on it? So you can't rely on in mean good answers. But I mean, you can also rely on doctors to give 100% good answers. This mm -hmm. uh, model just needs to be better than the average doctor to be usable. It's, like... it's true. So you can't really rely on doctors always giving good answers. I mean, in this case, you can't also rely on the doctors giving a 100% good um, prediction or um, estimation if these answers are good or not. That's another question. But maybe in this case, if they are trained and they don't have to do anything else, then these answers should be at least reliable. But yeah, should I mean, yeah, you can argue that uh, an automatic system should be better than a human and then you can at least replace or you can use it instead of a human because it's not worse. But then you would have an, or run into other problems like who is then responsible if somebody, something happens based on these answers. So uh, yes and no, in my opinion. If a doctor gives a very bad advice and something bad happens, then the doctor is in most case responsible. But uh, what happens if you put up an automatic system and it gives a bad advice? I don't know. All right. Copyright. Oh, I already hinted about this a bit, so I won't go into the detail here. So who's the author of AI-generated texts? In most cases, it doesn't really matter in my opinion. But AI-supported systems are not considered authors. They're not persons. They're not entities that can write texts. So um, they are not, they don't have a copyright. And at least according to one survey that I found, users can claim authorship if there's a significant degree of intellectual contribution. Whatever this means, I have no idea. So you have again then to define what this means. What is a significant degree of intellectual contribution? Does this mean, okay, I've changed some words on it. This is now a significant degree or not. So this is a very legally gray area that I don't have any idea what to do. Okay, privacy. Also something that you maybe discussed in your uh, in your lectures on um, maybe uh, if, if large language models can replicate something from the training, training data. So here somebody types in, long live the revolution. Our next meeting will be at, and then the language model adds at the docks at midnight on June 28. Aha, found them. So 
what does this hint at? Well, it hints at um, replicating or uh, leaking information from your training data that is maybe very personal. So here's a realistic example. It's also stated in many papers from 2021 from the GPT-2 model. If you would prefix something like East Stroudsburg, Stroudsburg, and then said, okay, please now uh, replicate text, then it would replicate exact addresses from people that were in the training process and the training data. So exact addresses with telephone numbers, uh, with their um, email addresses and all of this. This should not be something that is generated uh, from our models. So these are just personal data. And there's also other examples where training data could uh, would be generated with uh, sensitive data um, from the medical domain. So here, there was a training data set um, from yeah, with several people that have different health records. And then you have a must uh, have a language model. And based on several of these approaches, so just by prompting and say, okay, Mr. Lehmann has dot, 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 it would then fill out, okay, this person has diabetes or just generating some data and say, okay, let's look what, ge what it generates. And at some point it generates that Mr. Lehmann has diabetes. Comment? Maybe you can advertise how many projects and you're still running right now and you are new new tools, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. So if you are interested in uh, making this impossible, then we have a research project that is dealing with privatizing data. So based not only on uh, privatizing or uh, making it impossible that this explicit information is leaked, but also other uh, information that could lead to your person, for example, your writing style or something. That's something we have now. And if you're interested, then the he is the person. I'm also a person. You can write and inform that you would be part of. So, I mean, leaking private data is one thing. Also, some people might not realize it that you are sending if you are now uh, putting private data into the prompt and sending it to the servers, for example, of OpenAI and other parties that you are sending them your data. I mean, they say they don't store it and only use it to help training these models. I wouldn't rely on this. So this is something that you should at least put in mind. So there can always be the risk of data breaches or misuse of the data if you put on up your really private stuff into JetGPT. And yeah, there's also other security risks. So neural models can be vulnerable to cyber attacks, creative prompting like you've seen before and could lead to unintended outputs. There have been some indications at least that this can be made better, for example, by deduplication. So deduplication of the training data. So here they said, okay, some of this data was just replicated by the model because they've, they've seen it maybe in the same format and the same wording 60,000 times. And now they've seen it so many times that they could replicate it. If you use some techniques to deduplicate the data, so the training data doesn't uh, use as much duplicates anymore, then they said, okay, the percentage of memorized data in this um, in this experiment at least was reduced. If this really works in all cases, I don't know, but maybe there are some approaches that can make this better. But I mean, the real approach for this is either uh, reducing the private data in the training step in the first place or making really a better effort other than just deep duplication, but making sure that no private data is generated. Is this also the problem that can duplicate data that should be duplicated? For example, if you ask it, what's the declaration of the defendants or something like that, that is something that it should duplicate word for word, but probably couldn't anymore under this. Yeah, so the problem could be that some stuff that should be replicated word by word isn't anymore. It's possible, yeah. All right, and last, really, and then this lecture is done with so many problems. And this is all, also something that I can only hint at. So I have no idea how this develops. It's the impact on jobs. So in 2016, uh, McKinsey stated that two job categories are really safe and there's low potential for automation, jobs relating to managing and developing people and jobs involving decision-making, planning or creative work. And another work says, okay, to it, I'll say it's supposedly the hardest to automate is writing software code. I mean, 
I don't know how good these estimations were, but at the moment we see that, I mean, this is really uh, not the case. This assertion has been challenged. I don't know if people are really, can be replicated now by something like JGPT, but at least um, these uh, models have the capability to do parts of this job really well. And um, yeah, other things maybe not so well. There's here another uh, survey from Goldman Sachs who says, okay, how much of the job we at least estimate, how much of this can be um, automated. And at the bottom, you have something like building and construction work. Yeah, there, of course, AI cannot really do anything. But here at the top, where uh, lots of the day-to-day -day work from people can be automated, something like office and administration support or legal um, support or architecture and engineering. So these are jobs that, at least in their point of view, have a high risk of job automation and displacement, which is different to the survey from 2016. If this is really something that will happen, we don't know, nobody knows. Um, I'm really eager to see how much impact these technologies really have on the job market. All right, so just to sum things up, um, almost on time. So Generative AI, as you've seen, has use, have many creative use cases and it can generate diverse content and can help in a variety of tasks and you can use it for a lot of stuff also to augment and help you with existing uh, processes and um, um, use cases. But I hope I could at least open your mind for some legal and, uh, ethical and legal challenges. So is it plagiarism or not? At least a question that's open to debate. Privacy uh, issues, biases that are replicated. It can be very difficult to control and verify and interpret, yeah. The rep, uh, reproducibility for all of the stuff that you want to improve these systems with is also a huge problem. And it may have social and economic impacts. We don't know yet, but I mean, you will see in the next years. Are there any other questions on this topic? Yeah. I'm wondering how voice generation is because like, like, uh, like, I don't know, it. You can use what? Uh, Ah, yeah. So stylography is um, no, no, when you type like messages in the keyboard. Ah, okay. I've heard of it, but I have no idea if you can use it for this case. So I was wondering about that. Maybe you could like for example if you have like you could hear this voice, like try and split it up and maybe like like put messages in it and then say like oh well, yeah, using it to hide messages that could hint in if it's generated or not, but uh, yeah, then you would have to use a generator that actually does this. So it's again kind of a watermark that can be just circumvented by using a different generator that doesn't use this watermark. I mean, maybe, but it's at least something that you could hide in somewhere, at least we have also have these pictures that have hidden uh, messages in there. So it could be an approach, but at least it's also something that everybody then has to implement other than that it won't work. There was a comment here from, all right. Other questions, comments, concerns? If that's not the case, then thank you very much. And yeah, have a nice exam time. <laughs> I don't know.